Welcome to my first ever Emacs Conf talk. This is really exciting for me. I've done lots of conferences, but rarely ones this technical and this nerdy. I also feel like I have something interesting to share. I come to Emacs relatively late in my career, only about six years ago, but I've been absolutely amazed at the innovation and commitment of the community to do things their own way. Oftentimes, these become things that are not readily available anywhere else. So as I've been using Emacs and org mode specifically a great deal in my day-to-day -day workflows, I've been leaning more and more into some of these tips and tricks, and I find that there is almost every day that I discover some useful tweak that can make my development better. I want to share them with you now. Hey, hold on. Who are you? I'm you. From the future! Oh, nice. Uh, good. No, I'm you from like a month from now. Look, you know how these talks are pre-recorded, and you know how you've spent the last two years criticizing conference speakers for trying to do the same old thing and not creatively adapting to the online conference medium? Well, you are recording this back in November. I'm in December when everyone is watching this for the first time. That is something we can do now. Okay, so this is a gimmick. Cool. And I see you still haven't figured out how to remove backgrounds with OBS. Oh my god, it's such a pain. I have to get a plugin or something. So, yes, it's kind of a gimmick, but I also have a cool point. You know how you just said that you discover something new every day? Well, your talk isn't that long, and I found a bunch of cool new workflows since. Oh. Okay, that makes sense. I'm starting a new job in the intervening time. Exactly! So I have more stuff I want to add. Oh, and I bet that once we set the ground rules, the audience might have some of their own suggestions. That, that is a good idea. Okay, go away now. Fine, but aren't you going to explain the dino? This is Emacs Conf, dude. You think a dinosaur built out of boxes and old dishwasher parts is the weirdest background thing we'll see? Roar! Okay, bye now. So hey everyone, you heard the idea. This is going to be a thinly veiled attempt to show you stuff about Emacs and org mode specifically that I think is super cool and immediately useful while you're doing development. Let's define the scope of org development workflow as Something specific you do with org mode that helps in certain common development related activities. Now, tie-dye me from the future said he's got some more ideas beyond what I'm presenting here. I'm sure many of you have ideas as well. So we're going to share a collaborative document. And let's all, as we're listening to this, be talking and chat and entering our own ideas and workflows so that we can learn and improve together. And now with that, let's begin. I've got a ton of ground to cover, and I want to start by talking about notetaking. Shrink down! Notetaking is incredibly important. We can't keep all this stuff in our heads. So, uh, for example, I find myself with the need to learn about the solid project. This right here is the solid project, and I want to play around with it. I am going to start by creating a note for it. Now, one of the things that I want to do is uh, explore one of their tutorials. That's the site I just saw. I can go ahead and create a note for myself. Okay. Solid React example, and maybe a set of stuff ending on there. I'm going to clone this project, which I've already done. I can pull it up right here. So I, I can pull it up right here, and I can now start to explore it. So for example, this code base sounds it seems interesting. I'm gonna uh, want to store a link to this in my code. I'm gonna run org store link, and I can come in here and say uh, let's explore the structure. The link. That right there. So now at any given time, I can come to this node and be thrown right into the structure. Right. So I want to go and now start investigating the code. 
But before doing that, I'm going to take an extra step <coughs> and I'm going to take an extra step and customize the, um, the org capture system. So I'm going to create a playground node here where I can do whatever I want. Now, what does this template do? Well, it's just going to create a new template that whenever I hit the S key, it is going to go ahead and uh, add a new heading to which I will enter and it's going to grab a link to wherever I'm pointing at and uh, any highlighted code will also be inserted into the source block and uh, eventually and drop my cursor where I click. So we can grab our template and the one thing I'm going to need to add it here is to say what file this goes to. I'm going to copy the name of this file and put it right in there. And I'm going to go ahead and now run this template. Now I, we can explore our code. So for example, I can look in the server and say, oh yeah, this slide looks interesting. Capture that. There you see our template. You see, yeah, this is an XJS app. And you can see it got added right in here, right next to my other code. So that, that's interesting. And I can always go ahead and click that link and get thrown directly to where in the code I was. I'm kind of building up my own uh, dashboard as I explore this project of interesting points within the project. One of the things uh, I notice here by looking at the file structure is that there is a area for certificates. That's a little unusual. So we'll make a note of that by again running org store link. This comes with certificates. And so we'll put that there. One of the uh, good standbys, right, is just to use our regular shell commands. So we will go ahead and say the default directory for this is our project, and we can go ahead and say cat certificates localhost.co.key, and then we'll output the first five lines of it, right, just to make sure it's a regular certificate. Now, notice this got broken up uh, a little bit. This is by due to Emacs auto formatting. We can come in here and uh, tell it to format it as code, which will be the same as this block right here. Now there are other options available. If, for example, we don't want to be a shell block, we want a uh, Python block for some reason, we can wrap SFC Python and uh, execute that. And no, is now wrapped as a Python block, but I like it as a shell. Let's, for example, go down into pages here and look at this document file. We're saying, okay, well, the, this this looks interesting. Um, maybe we highlight that, and we'll go ahead and capture that template and say, really grab all this code and paste it in here. Um, now there is a bug at the moment where if you highlight more than one lines of code, the link will not work. And that's uh, honestly it might be something I look into fixing, but. Um, one of the things that might be useful here would be to check out how this file has evolved over time. And to do that, I'm going to use Mogit. I'll put up, pull up a log. And um, so look, there, there's only a single change. I'm going to run a command called uh, orgit store link. And now I can come in here and say it's only changed once. Go ahead and insert that link. Now, this file, uh, the arguments here are kind of weird. And in fact, if I click this, it will actually go to the full log of that branch. However, we can fix that pretty easily. Grab the path of our file. And this right here is really just the arguments that are passed into the log command. So we go, we put that in there. 
and it, and there we go. We can get the full file history. Now I want to actually build the program. So build the app. Now I could, of course, run it as a shell, right? npm ci. The problem with that is that Emacs is single threaded. So if I were to do that, um, the entire time while it was running, it would be uh, locking out my emails. Additionally, I might not actually want all that scroll, and PMC, I produce a lot of it, actually in my document. So instead, what we could do is use an Emacs Lisp function. It's called async shell command. And when you run something in async shell command, it's going to uh, comment buffer with a process attached to it and run it in there. I will need to set the directory here first. And since, again, hey, this is going to be opening up in a new buffer, I don't need to see that. I'm going to run it. And um, what's going to happen is it's actually not going to work. And it doesn't work, not for any particular reason I can control. It's unfortunately that the repo is broken. But that is a totally valid uh, result of our investigation. One of the things that uh, I really love to do with org mode is to uh, actually use it for literate program. Because org mode has a pretty capable uh, code generation facility built into it. It's called Tangling. So if I, if I go ahead and uh, take my document, this is for a little Arduino project where I was figuring out uh, to spin things around from a, uh, using a window. Um, I can go ahead and write a script like this. Okay? And then notice I use the tangle variable. That is just going to determine where that file gets written when we call the command for Babel tangle. So if I were, if I go ahead and run this, you can see down in the mini buffer, it's going to write to temp, go batsy playground, go batsy playground, and I end up, that's where this right here would uh, write, and then I, I can go up, run commands to run it. Then I want to start uh, being able to use this to build out a program. So I'm, I'm going ahead and writing in prose and interspersing it with code. Right? So it's the, it's the inverse of uh, code in which you intersperse comments, you write prose, and then you intersperse code where as needed. Tangle is implicitly defined uh, up at the higher level in this property block right here, which I will talk about in a, in a little bit. But if you want to see what uh, what properties are available at any given time, you can hit or Babel view source block info right there, and you can see Tangle is enabled. All of these blocks have the exact same tangle. Right? And if I run and see what it is, okay, there it's just going to write right to this directory to go back to I no or Babel tangle. It's going to go ahead and tangle all these source code blocks, and I can go ahead and look at my file, and here it is. This is this is a full Arduino file that was generated from there. Um, I start writing code here. Basically doing it in a prose way as I'm thinking about it, I write down what I'm going to do. Now these uh, braces, we haven't seen these before. This is a, a, an aspect of org called Nowhere, which again is not too much of a templating system too, either. but it does one thing, which is insert code, which turns out to be enough. So that this right here basically says you take that uh, the block with that exact name and just insert insert here. If you want to see exactly what a block expands to, you're going to come in here. Uh, you're going to run or Babel expand source block. And there we go. That's what this block expands to. That's what all this bits and bits and bits and bits expands to. So uh, that becomes really useful. And notice basically we just take these little blocks that are not going to be tangled directly, but we have this other block, and we turn off their tangle. Their tangle. Um, so now that you you have uh, some sort of tangling, you want to be able to interact with those files up here uh, that are written to, um, to that directory. So right here, I have an area where uh, I can do things like run a compiler. Now, what does that compiler do? Well, this right here references a source code block that appears in another org file. 
And I find that when doing these sort of things, it can be useful to have a little utility org directory. So here it is, org. See how that org is just part of my repo. We open up, and here we go. I have a compile function. Basically, it's doing some stuff to clean up things correctly, but then using that same async shell command to open things up in a new buffer, uh, in this case named after whatever uh, heading it was under. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and inside of it run um, Arduino CLI command to compile and uh, pass that into watch exec, uh, which, will, which is a little Rust program that watches uh, INO files for any changes and when they detect it, it will run this. So if I were to, for example, add a line here and now run for Babel Tangle, you can see watch exec immediately uh, picks it up and starts. Now it's kind of a pain to remember to run or Babel Tangle all the time. So I can come here and click this button. It says it asks me to execute it there. And what, what does that do? Here you go. It's just a very simple hyperlink, but uh, to the ELISP protocol. The ELISP protocol just adds the a hook that says whenever uh, a document is saved, run or Babel table. And now that I've run that, I can go ahead and in here and delete that. And look at that, it tangles uh, automatically for me. Because I don't wanna actually have this playground script tangled to my real file. I need this concept of some sort of workspace directory. And a workspace directory, what I really want is a variable that is tied to where in my document hierarchy this appears. I want a uh, dynamically scoped variable that's scoped to my document. And you can do that. So for example, in this case, I have in my properties a little key value de uh, declared workspace directory, goes into a temp directory. And here by running or get entry starting at the current point, find workspace directory with a second parameter of one. You can see down in the mini, in the mini buffer, goes to temp, go back to play. Um, th this right here is going to override the workspace directory at the top level, which is dot. Right? Dot means here. That's what makes sure that the rest of these tangle to that go bat CU file right relevant to here. Um, and that does mean that we need a little bit more complex thing here. So we're saying go ahead and uh, or get or entry get the um, workspace directory. If anyone hasn't seen this syntax, this is this uh, dash uh, arrow is from the um, from the dash dot l library, which is basically a big library of all the utility functions that you wish Emacs Lisp had that are well named. I highly, highly recommend it, and this is the threading operator. So we're just basically taking it, uh, getting the workspace directory, if it happens to be dot, and we're just gonna return the current directory. Otherwise, whatever directory it said. And then I, I wanna just take a moment and look at the rest of this structure. So workspace directory we talked about, header args, if you noticed, none of my uh, code blocks for the most part have any uh, header arg. You can drop the header args property, which is going to be arg header arguments that are added automatically to all, all source code blocks under this under this uh, heading. Header args plus, well, sometimes you don't want to type, you have a bunch of args, you don't want to type them out in this one big line. So you basically are adding a new header arg to the existing list of header args. And then you can have header arcs that are specific to certain languages. Like for example, this uh, this default directory var is going to be set for all Emacs Lisps, and for all Arduino's evaluation will be disabled and tangling will be automatic. So these are just some of the uh, workflows that become useful when you're actually doing the coding. Oh, hello again, me from the six months from now. Cool. Uh, the talk over. People liked it. Thought the pacing was all over the place. Yeah, I had to cut like two thirds of it. Going to be filling in those gaps in the etherpad, and the editing was uneven. 
at best. I got way better at it as I worked on it, didn't I? Caden Live is pretty cool. But yeah, I want to take a shot at something different, and I figured if anyone can appreciate trying something different, it's EmacsConf, right? I hope people found it useful. Yeah, some did. Oh, I should tell you about the coming Orca War.